All right, we're gonna kick it over to uh, Chris hey, Law to get. All right, uh, what's up, everyone? Uh, like Ian already kind of gave away, my name is Christoph, and I'm a sophomore at ODU now on the football team. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to say on behalf of the podcast that we're so excited that you guys are here tonight uh, and that you came back to join us. Uh, that's really awesome. Unfortunately, I don't know you guys personally, but sound great from all the stories I've heard. Uh, just so everyone knows, uh, we're here on Zoom every Monday night at 7.30 to 8.30 Eastern Time, and we're going to do that continuing throughout the summer. I believe we are starting our study on Philippians, if I'm correct. Uh, and right now, I think I'm passing it to Ian for some spiritual snacks. All right. Thank you, Christoph. So uh, I get the honor of orchestrating the spiritual snacks. And if you're new to the spiritual snacks, it's something that we do just to hear about how God's working in our lives or the lives of others. Uh, we follow the ABCs, keep it audible, uh, brief, and christ centered i have not planted anyone in the crowd tonight so i'll i'll share one and then i'm gonna uh take a leap of faith and throw it out to you guys to share a couple as well mine actually is a one that is long a long time coming uh seven years ago the copperheads baseball team lived in the athletes in action house 30 baseball players from around the country I uh, I got to share the gospel with a few of them, and one guy kind of tracked with throughout the years, and he just kept getting more and more into the faith. And last week he got gave me a call and said about four years ago he gave his life to Christ. Uh, he joined FCA, so he's kind of in ministry now, and he said that house and having that gospel shared uh, was the first seed that was planted in his, his life to, to bring him to Christ. So I was just felt really honored uh, that God would use me in the house and everybody involved in that way. So that is my quick spiritual snack. Uh, who else has the spiritual snack for the group? All right, you all must be muted or something like that. I'm just going to randomly, let's go Kristoff. Kristoff, you have a good spiritual snack for us? Throw it on the spot. Um, okay, uh, well, I've been talking a lot with our head of FCA over here in Virginia, and we're on a weekly call, and we actually started uh, going through – I believe it was Second Chronicles, or maybe it was, for, I, you know, we just we just started going through some of the Bible, and it was it was awesome. It was like we just started, so we're catching, we're getting through it, but you know, it's just really great. It's great. Cool. All right, thanks for sharing. Anyone else have a quick spiritual snack for the group? Can I share with you? Yes. Um, mine is a little bit similar to yours in that it's just um, catching up with people from the past. So I know that Emily just reached out to me this last week. And the thing that encouraged me so much is she said, I've been watching the Monday night meetings on YouTube. And I thought, what? I thought I know we were posting them. I didn't know if anyone was watching them. And I went back and looked at YouTube to see if anyone actually has been watching our meetings and we've been getting an impressive number of views and I thought that was so exciting so then I got to talk to Emily and catch up and that was awesome and she obviously got clear here tonight but I just think it's so neat how the Lord knits our lives together with other people and sometimes he uses us when we have no idea who's looking kind of like your story with Eddie so that is cool all right, well, thanks for sharing, everybody. Uh, welcome to Maya and Sean who just jumped on the call. Actually, Sean Luau, the story I told was when Sean was in the house as well. So it's kind of a cool connecting yeah, to Christoph. Thanks, Ian. Uh, so now I believe we're going to have some announcements from Miss Mindy. 
Yeah, and our announcement list is very short this week. Um, first of all, on Thursday night at 8 p.m., we are having another um, girls' night event, and we may turn this into somewhat of a regular Bible study just for ladies who are interested in doing that. Um, but if you want some good girl time and some fellowship and some input from the Word, um, keep looking at our Instagram and post a Zoom link. And this Thursday night at 8 o'clock, come one, come all females only. Sorry, guys. Um, but yeah, we'd love to have you just to get some time together. So that's this Thursday night. Next Monday night, uh, we're back here like usual, but we have two special guests who are showing up and none of you know them, but you just have to take my word that they're awesome and you don't want to miss them. So make sure you come back next week, bring a few extra friends and that's all we got. Nice. That sounds really cool. I'm kind of excited to see who these people are. Um, so I believe now we're going to have a vision spot from Mr. MH. All right. Uh, good to see you guys again. Uh, miss you guys so much. Glad B&A are coming back into town soon, as well as uh, the rest of you. And former Bobcats, the uh, swimmers, we're glad that you're joining with us. Uh, we've missed you. And and so glad that you're here tonight. Let me ask you a question. What happens when I throw this rock into a lake? If you answered, it creates ripples, that's correct. How many ripples do you think this little stone would create and how far would it spread? One million. Oh, nice, nice. In that case, what happens when I throw this into the lake? 20 million ripples. What happens when BK, CI, and I throw Christoph Atkinson in the lake? That's a good billion, billion. Infinity ripples. <laughs> I want to read you all a passage of scripture that I hope you're familiar with. It's from 2 Timothy, and 2 Timothy was written by the Apostle Paul, and it's probably the last book that he wrote. So you could say it's his last will and testament to his one of his key disciples, Timothy, and uh, you could also say it's his playbook. It's his manual for spiritual warfare and for reaching the lost for Christ. And this is what Paul says to Timothy in chapter 2, verse 2. And the thing you've learned and heard from me, instruct to faithful witnesses and will be to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so if you look at that, Paul is saying, Timothy, what you've heard from me, I want you to teach others, and then the, hopefully those others will go on to teach others. So who are you currently teaching in your life? Who's teaching you? Who are you teaching? And who are they teaching? Right now, I want, to, I want you to listen to a brief video from one of our former, former, former Bobcats, Lee Renfro. Lee was uh, a force on the football field played middle linebacker, was captain on the football team. He joins, he interned here with Athletes in Action for a year, then he joined staff, and then he went on to become a youth pastor in the Dayton area. So I want you to watch a video from Lee when he talks about the ripple effect of 2 Timothy 2.2. Hey guys, I want to tell you about Mark. I met Mark my uh, probably my freshman year of college while I was at Ohio University, uh, and Mark was kind of the chaplain for our football team. Mark had this lovable personality. He was bold, and, and he was very engaging and passionate, and uh, he led a Bible study on, uh, helped lead a Bible study on our, on our team. And um, after a few years, Mark finally reached out to me to kind of go and, and get together and talk. And uh, it was when I was with Mark that he 
asked me two of the most important questions that really changed my life is if I were to die today, how sure am I that I would go to heaven? And I hadn't really pondered that question in a, in a way that uh, Mark had shared it before. And so that's where uh, my life began to change as God began to use Mark uh, in incredible ways to help me to know what it looked like to follow Jesus, to give my life to Jesus. And so uh, because of Mark's impact on my life, um, I've been able to influence other people for Christ. And so the ripple effect that Mark had by reaching out to me and introducing me to Jesus forever. Ever has changed my life. And so um, I would love for you, as I'm sure you maybe have a similar story, that somebody has impacted your faith in an incredible way, that they reached out to you and, and their investment in your life has had a ripple effect in your life. And so I'd love for you to share that, share your story, your ripple effect story. And, and I would love to invite you uh, to our Easter services at First Light Church as we look at the ripple effect of the resurrection. And so I hope you have a great week. And uh, again, I'm just thankful for the investment Mark had in my life. And I'm praying God would have a greater impact in your life because of it. So what ripple effect are you having and, and how will that continue? Thanks, Christoph. Now we'll turn it over to Mark Stickle and we'll start our steady study of Philippians chapter one. Thanks, Mark. Mark, you're on mute. Am I on? Can you hear me okay? Okay, yeah, we're beginning a four-week study of Philippians tonight. And uh, when Mark asked me to begin this study, I said he's got to give me some time at the beginning to talk about Paul. I think Paul uh, needs to be discussed. You need to know a little bit about Paul's background. Some of you may know some information about him, but I think if, if, if we're gonna begin a study, and it's gonna be the next four weeks, I'm doing tonight, Minnie's doing next week. And I think Dean Webb is doing the following week and then we'll conclude with chapter, chapter four. It's, an, it's extremely important you know a little bit about Paul. Paul wrote 13 books in the New Testament. And being there's only 27 books in the New Testament, you can see that his writings are extremely important. Many of the letters he wrote are to churches he started on his mission journeys. And, and it's a fascinating story. They are must-read books. There's so much in them. Uh, what he wrote a couple thousand years ago was relevant then, and it's so, so relevant now. And it's so important for believers to, to study who he was, what he did, and what he wrote. And it's amazing, uh, the 13 books he wrote, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. It, it covers so much. Paul, in his writings, he talks about God's gospel. He talks about Christian conduct, salvation by grace. He talks about the church our Christian experience, Christ's return, church order, holding the truth. And it, it's so important that we, that we learn about him. Jody and I, my wife and I read this book. Uh, we read it last year. And it's, it's a biography of the life of Paul. And it's written by John Paul. And it's an amazing quick read. I think you can get it for a dollar and a half on Kindle. It's an amazing biography of Paul. And it's a really cultural journey of who he was in his journey of writing, writing these books and, and becoming a believer. Let me tell you about Paul's birth. He was born a Jew in the city of Tarsus around 10 AD. And that would have been, uh, that would have maybe been in his late 20s when Christ was teaching. And he was actually known as Saul Paul. The two names were common for people back then. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He had Hebrew parentage and he was a strict Pharisee. He was trained as a rabbi and also as a tent maker. Kind of a second occupation there. He had a fiery temperament and he hated the believers. He confronted the believers. He thought they were heretics. He had, he had an extremely temperamental individual who was extremely angry a lot of times. He persecuted believers house to house. He was, he was present at the stoning of Stephen, who we know about from scripture. He was heading to Damascus, though, one day to attack Christians. And he had this vision. Jesus talked to him. And from that point on, 
he began to be known as Paul. He had this conversion, an extremely important part of Acts 9, where we read the account and the difficulties he had then convincing the disciples that he was a true believer. They saw him as a heretic, they, or they saw him as, as, as a persecutor of believers. Here he'd accepted Christ. He'd had this vision of Jesus, and he was now a believer. But the disciples, it took him a little bit of time to convince the disciples that he was really a believer. Once they realized and accepted that he was a believer, though, he was off and traveled. He went on three missionary journeys between 44 AD and 58 AD. Uh, there was really a fourth journey on a ship to Rome that he took that he, that he taught along the way, too. He traveled over 10,000 miles on these missionary journeys. And remember, there are no frequent flyer miles back then. <laughs> it was all walking, traveling on horses or donkeys or whatever it might have been. And it was on his second missionary journey that he visited Philippi. And Luke, writing in Acts 16, describes that first visit to Philippi by Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And it was around 50 AD that he, that he visited. And Philippi was a Roman military colony of about 10,000 people. It's in, it was in present-day northern Greece, and they spent about three weeks there. There was no Jewish synagogue. There was no place of worship in Philippi when he, when he got there. And I'm going to read out of six, Acts 16, 12 to 15, Luke's account of that first visit. Putting out from the harbor at Troas, we made a straight run for Samothrace. The next day, we tied up a new city and walked from there to Philippi, the main city in that part of Macedonia, and even more important, a Roman colony. We lingered there several days, and on the Sabbath, we left the city and went down along the river where we had heard there was to be a prayer meeting. But we took our place with the women who had gathered there and talked with them. One woman, Lydia, was from Thyatira and a dealer in expensive textiles. And she was known to be a God-fearing woman. And as she listened with intensity to what was being said, the master gave her a trusting heart and she believed. And afterwards, she was baptized along with everyone in the household she said, in a surge of hospitality, if you're confident that I'm in this with you and believe in this master truly, come home with me and be my guests. We hesitated, but she wouldn't take no for an answer. So right there, the first believer in Philippi that Paul brought to the Savior. Unbelievable. And several days later, while they were sharing Christ, Paul and Silas were beaten, stripped, and imprisoned from removing an evil spirit from a slave girl. And it's a fascinating encounter in Acts of that, that prison encounter where a jailer was converted. Well, they were released and set on their way, but their work began, the work that, that there began, and, and salvation uh, was beginning to, to spread in that area. Paul visited Philippi again on his third missionary journey, and that's described in Acts 20, and actually visited Philippi then on the way home from that journey. And the people in the church he started there were very, extremely dear to him. That ministry began by God through Paul, and it continued by the grace of God. The actual letter Paul wrote to the Philippians, the one we're going to start our, our study on, was written about 60 AD while Paul was in prison in Rome. And he wrote his letter to the Philippian church and their followers. And it was about eight to ten years after that first visit. And Epaphroditus from Philippi was visiting Paul in prison. And he's referred to in chapter 2, and Mindy will talk about him next week. And he probably took this letter. This from Rome back to Philippi. And as we'll see in the weeks ahead, this letter, the Philippians, expresses so much love for this church and their people. Okay, let's get into Philippians now. Chapter 1. And I'm going to be reading from the Message Bible. So, so pay attention here. Starting off in verse 1. Paul and Timothy, both of us committed servants to Christ Jesus, write this letter to all the followers of Jesus in Philippi, pastors and ministers included. We greet you with the grace and peace that comes from God, our Father, and our Master, Jesus Christ. So here, right off the bat, Paul is describing themselves as committed servants of Christ wholeheartedly dedicated to, to Christ. And we might say in bondage to Christ, slaves to Christ. 
And are we, the, are we really slaves to Jesus Christ? It's interesting, too. He addresses this letter to the pastors and the ministers. And it was Paul's practice at the end of the, these missionary journeys when he was in these places to select leaders in, in the various churches to kind of lead, lead things along. Reading on, verse 3. Every time you cross my mind, I break out in exclamations of thanks to God. Each exclamation is a trigger to prayer. I find myself praying for you with a glad heart. I'm so pleased that you have continued on in this with us, believing and proclaiming God's message from the day you heard it right up to the present. There's never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. He's always praying when he thought of the people. Exclamations of, of thanks, vocal loud thanks. And remember, Paul's in prison here. So he had a lot of time to, to think about people and to pray for them. Paul thanked God for the Christians there, even with what he'd been through on his first visit. And he always remembered them in prayer. And we need to remember that power of prayer. When we think of a friend, we can do nothing greater for them than to pray for them. Keep that in mind. Moving on, verse 7. It's not at all fanciful for me to think this way about you. My prayers and hopes have deep roots in reality. You have, after all, stuck with me all the way from the time I was thrown in jail, put on trial, and came out of it in one piece. All along, you've experienced with me the most generous help from God. He knows how much I love and miss you these days. Sometimes I think I feel as strongly about you as Christ does. So this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus will be proud of, bountiful in fruits from his soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. Paul continually prayed for the Philippians. He prayed that their love might abound. He desired that their love must always desire the best for others. Does our love, does our love really desire the best for people that we say we love. Well, Paul didn't want their love to be misdirected either. So he further prayed that their love would grow in the knowledge of God's will. Their knowledge needed to develop, needed to develop into a maturity to be able to understand the difference between right and wrong. And all Christians should grow in the knowledge of right and wrong, not only for ourselves, but so that we can successfully teach others. And Paul also prayed that the brethren at Philippi would follow only those things that would keep them in a right relationship with God. Something for us to remember. Moving on, verse 12. I want to report to you, friends, that my imprisonment here has had the opposite of its intended effect. Instead of being squelched, the message has actually prospered. All the soldiers here and everyone else, too, found out that I'm in jail because of this Messiah. That piqued their curiosity, and now they've learned all about him. Not only that, but most of the followers of Jesus here have become far more sure of themselves in the faith than ever, speaking out fearlessly about God, the Messiah. You know, some might have thought Paul's imprisonment would have stopped his work, but no, no way. God used his circumstances to present more opportunities to preach. Here's Paul in chains, finding doors opening, which sure to encourage us to open doors, even in times of our troubles. And with everything going on now, what a perfect time to encourage and share with others. You know, Paul's imprisonment was also used by God to embolden his brethren. His willingness to die for the preaching of Jesus stood as a great example for those around him who might have been fearful in their faith. We need to be strong in our faith so that others can see through us and get rid of their fears that, that, that they might have. Very important, very important to remember. Moving on in verse 15. 
It's true that some preach Christ because with me out of the way, they think they'll step right in the spotlight. But the others do it with the best heart in the world. One group is motivated by pure love, knowing that I'm here, defending the message, wanting to help. The others, now that I'm out of the picture, are merely greedy, hoping to get something out of it for themselves. Well, their motives are bad. They see me as their competition. And so the worse it goes for me, the better they think for them. Well, so how am I to respond? Well, I've decided that I really don't care about their motives, whether mixed, bad, or indifferent. Every time one of them opens his mouth, Christ is proclaimed. So I just cheer them on. This is an, an interesting section of scripture that, that Paul's writing to the Philippians. Evidently, some were jealous of Paul's success as a preacher. People in Rome knew he was preaching. People in no Rome who, who had accepted Christ knew he was in jail. They were more interested in promoting themselves as preachers. And obviously, preachers who know God's purpose will seek to unite Christians under the lordship of Jesus with no emphasis on personal followings. But some of these men had the right message but the wrong motive. We need to have the right message and the right motive. This is important here. We cannot share Christ thinking about ourselves. We must remember to share so people follow Jesus and not us. It happens way too often, and I've seen it happen, where people begin to minister, people begin to evangelize, people begin to talk to friends and get them involved in Christ. And they sometimes forget that I'm doing that for the person to follow Jesus. I don't want them to follow me. I don't need them to follow me. I need them to follow Jesus. Interesting, though, Paul says at the end of this, <laughs> even though some preached Christ hoping to gain a personal following, Paul was still thankful Christ was being, was being preached. So in the midst of all that, at least Christ was, was still being, being preached. Continuing, verse 19. And I'm going to keep that celebration going because I know how it's going to turn out. Through your faithful prayers and the generous response of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, everything he wants to do in and through me will be done. I can hardly wait to continue on my course. I don't expect to be embarrassed in the least. On the contrary, everything happening to me in this jail only serves to make Christ more accurately known, regardless of whether I live or die. They didn't shut me up. They gave me a pulpit. Alive, I'm Christ's messenger. Dead, I'm his bounty. Life versus even more life. I can't lose. So even though Paul was in prison, he was confident God would deliver him to be able to continue his ministry. He might be delivered from prison to preach free, freely again, although it didn't happen, or he'd be able to continue ministering there in prison. His confidence was based in part on the prayers of people praying on his behalf. Paul did not look forward to failure, but the total success in showing Christ more clearly to others. And he's gonna do that either through his life or if he died. Moving to verse 22. As long as I'm alive in this body, there's good work for me to do. If I had to choose right now, I hardly know which I'd choose. Hard choice. The desire to break camp here and be with Christ is powerful. Some days I can think of nothing better. Remember, he's in prison when he says this. So I'm sure there were days when he felt it might be better to be with Christ. But most days, because of what you're going through, because he knew what the Philippian people were going through, I'm sure that it's better for me to stick it out here. So I plan to be around a while, companion to you, as your growth and joy in this life of trusting God continues. You can start looking forward to a great reunion when I come visit you again. We'll be praising Christ, enjoying each other. If the choice of life or death were left to him, he, he didn't, he wasn't quite sure what he was, would choose. And as he, he saw it, continued life offered him opportunities for service and fruit bearing. And you know, in fact, each day of our life, should be given in service to God every single day. That's how we magnify the Lord and bring forth fruit. You know, I'm old, I'm 70, gonna be 70 years old next month. And <laughs> sometimes I, I get to thinking, oh Lord, just give me, take me home, get, get, me, get me over this. But then I know 
I know he's got more for me to do here. He's got more things that he wants me to do here on this earth for him. Verse 27, meanwhile, living in such a way, or live in such a way that you are a credit to the message of Christ. Let nothing in your conduct hang on whether I come or not. Your conduct must be the same whether I show up to see things for myself or hear of it from a distance. Stand united, singular in vision, contending for people's trust in the message, the good news, not flinching or dodging in the slightest before the opposition. Your courage and unity will show them what they're up against. Defeat for them, victory for you, and both because of God. You know, Paul, Paul wanted the Philippian brethren to behave in a manner worthy of their citizenship in the kingdom of Christ. We are citizens of Christ. He wanted them, he wants us to participate in presenting the message of Christ. And he wanted their conduct to be a good example of Christian living, whether he was with them or not. Our life as a Christian should always be guided by the word and not affected by the messenger's presence or absence. Paul wanted the brethren at Philippi to be united and courageous and not terrified. Finishing up here, he says, there's far more to this life than trusting in Christ. There's also suffering for him. And the suffering is as much a gift as the trusting. You're involved in the same kind of struggle you saw me go through, on which you are now getting an updated report in this letter. Paul counted it an honor to be able to believe in Christ and suffer for it. And suffering, of course, is those trials that Paul went through and what, what we went through. The Philippians had seen They'd heard, they knew what Paul was going through. They, were, they knew he was going through times of conflict. And Paul knew that at times the Philippians were experiencing these trials. And that's why he wrote to them. We will never go through anything in our walk that others haven't already gone through. And it's interesting, he views trials as gifts. How many sufferings and trials do we go through that we would view as a gift? And think of that the next time you're going through a trial. Think of that the next time you're suffering through something that's really tough. Boy, this is a gift. This is a gift from God. It's strengthening my faith. God is giving me the opportunity to grow in my faith because of this gift of a trial. Amazing. I want to close here with just some of the sufferings and trials Paul did go through. You know, Paul's a wonderful example of us, the someone in the Bible who faced continual trials. And that's why these books, these, these epistles of his that he wrote to the people of, of Philippi, Philippi and, and Ephesus and Colossae, in terms of, of telling them about what he was going through. You know, Paul speaks of his continued struggle in Romans with sin. He says he was always a slave to sin. He couldn't stop sinning. And he speaks of not being able to do what he wants, but instead what he hates. So he was a sinner. Paul was in prison over and over. He was flogged an uncounted number of times. He faced death threats. He, was received, he received 39 lashes from the Jews five times. He was beaten with rods. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. He spent days and nights on the sea. He was in continual danger from robbers. He was in danger from his own countrymen. Whatever city he went to, wherever he visited, he was in danger. He was weary and he was in pain. He was without sleep. He was hungry, thirsty, cold, naked. When Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was blind for three days before God restored his sight. Yet he was always concerned about the health of others, the health of his churches that God gave him to help minister to. So when we're facing trials, let's take a look at what Paul faced. Boy, it can put any trial that we face in a lot of perspective, in a different perspective. And I tell you, the rest of Philippians is, is, is marvelous. I can't wait to hear many next week speak about Philippians 2. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Paul. 
Lord, I can't wait to meet him in heaven and talk with him. I can't wait to get together with him and ask him about these missionary journeys he went on and what he faced and, and, and how you helped him survive, how you helped him begin churches, how you helped him minister to others, how you helped him to love other people. And Lord, may we, through this study of Philippians over the next, next weeks, may we learn about how we can be better servants, how we can be better ministers, how we can serve you by telling others about our love for Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you so much. Holy Spirit, you do so much for us. You dwell within us. You guide us. Jesus, you died for us. And Heavenly Father, your unconditional love for us is, is forever, and we thank you for that. Now continue to guide us the rest of this evening. Guide us this week, Lord, as we serve and minister and help others believe in you. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. Ian, Christoph, you're up. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you speaking. I learned a lot, and I and thank you for that. I believe now uh, Cody is going to separate us into small groups for discussion. Uh, so I don't know sure. how. Pardon? Yes, sir. You guys ready? We're going to teleport. And then we'll do that for about 10 minutes, and then when we're done, we'll come back into this room. All right, here we go. Three, two. One. Are we yeah. waiting on, like we're waiting on one more group. Is that right? One more group for Ru, I think. We got Tor. Yeah, yeah. Big Nether Tor. Yeah. Owen. A close up. We like the close up on your forehead. <laughs> oh no! Come back! Uh, wow, that's crazy, Ian. You made him yeah. this video. Oh uh, no! Ian, We're all think about love and understanding and building each other up here, Ian. I'm yeah. so sorry. That was my fault. Oh, Sean. All right. I guess I think this is the group pair. So um, I just want to. Uh, pray us out, but really uh, take a moment to kind of acknowledge uh, everything going on in the world. We had a, a meeting last week uh, with a lot of speakers that just brought some really good information and, and light to the situation of the, the racial injustices and just um, everything going on. Uh, we just want to cover it in prayer as God places things on our hearts uh, that he wants us to take action in. Uh, and just have a, a heart uh, for those uh, that are feeling that right now. So let me pray uh, as we finish up today's meeting. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you uh, for the ability to still connect and get together uh, over Zoom. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for your goodness. Uh, we thank you for uh, just your love uh, that you've bestowed upon us. Uh, thank you for Mark Stickle and the message that he brought tonight, uh, unpacking Philippians uh, with Paul, and allow us to just um, rest on that and, and allow that to soak in uh, as it impacts our lives. Uh, I want to pray uh, real specifically for the black community uh, right now, uh, on all the racial injustices that are being uncovered and and, and just new initiatives and, and whatever it might be uh, that are taking place, we just want to lift it up to you uh, that we have your heart. Allow us to feel uh, the hurt that you feel, but also allow us uh, to be uh, your healing hands as well. So allow us to, to step in and and do what Jesus would do uh, in the world at this time. So we just pray uh, for anything else that anybody has on their hearts tonight. Uh, we thank you so much uh, for these meetings each week. Amen. All right.
think that is it unless anybody else has any other nouns just feel free to stick around i might stick around for a little bit and, and talk to anybody that wants to hang on but uh, as far as that goes i think that is the end of the meeting next week same time the legendary mindy heflin will be bringing us an amazing uh, message from philippians 2.